Hi, everybody. Welcome. I'm Ken Mann, Managing Director at SCH Capital and Special Situations Practice, where we raise money for and sell troubled companies in many industries all across the United States. It has been a real honor and pleasure for me to work with AVI, with Bill Rochelle, and with this all star cast of panelists that we've had throughout the three parts of this series. Um, for those of you who haven't heard, I'm excited to take this opportunity to share with you that Jeff Marwill, um, with 37 years of experience leading workouts, corporate restructurings, and large Chapter 11 cases, uh, most recently with Proskauer in Chicago, has joined our Special Situations Investment Banking team at SCNH. I hope Jeff, Matt Lacasio, and I will see many of you in Phoenix at ABI Winter Leadership to learn more about what's going on in your worlds. Now on to today's show. Thanks for joining us for session number three, change of control via section 363, sale versus plan of reorganization. I'm gonna keep my introduction very brief. I encourage you to read the impressive bios of the panelists, um, which ABI will share in the chat. Melissa Root is the co-chair of Jenner and Block's bankruptcy and restructuring practice and manages the firm's Chicago office. She is a fellow of the American College of Bankruptcy and a 2017 recipient of ABI's 40 Under 40 Award. Melissa helps creditors, debtors, trustees, state fiduciaries, and investors craft the right approach to achieve their goals whether that is through aggressive litigation or strategic negotiations. She also represents clients in out-of-court restructurings and in acquisitions. Her pro bono legal work, her community leadership in Chicago, and her service to the bar are extensive and admirable. Now, to keep the Chicago theme going, our next panelist also has Chicago roots, having been named to Crane's Chicago Business 40 Under 40. And he's a living proof that a recovering attorney can become a great investment banker. Jeffrey Richards is the head of Capital Structure Advisory for Raymond James in New York. He has more than 20 years of transaction experience advising on more than 150 financings, restructurings, and M&A engagements. Mr. Richard's clients include public and private companies, private equity sponsors, and other institutional investors. Jeff was previously the head of special situations at William Blair and Company in Chicago and a partner at Kirkland and Ellis. Since 2001, he has taught as an adjunct professor at Northwestern Pritzker School of Law. Our moderator today is William J. Rochelle III. As you all well know, Bill is ABI's editor-at-large based in New York. He joined ABI in 2015, and he writes every day on developments in consumer and reorganization law. For the prior nine years, Mr. Rochelle was the bankruptcy columnist for Bloomberg News. Before turning to journalism, he practiced bankruptcy law for 35 years including 17 as a partner in the New York office at Fulbright and Jaworski. In addition to writing, Mr. Rochelle travels the country for ABI, speaking to bar groups and professional organizations on hot topics in the turnaround community and trends in consumer bankruptcies. Thank you panelists for your generosity and sharing your vast experience and wisdom with us today. Audience, you are in for a treat. And now Bill, the mic is yours to do what you do best. Well, thank you very much, Ken. Uh, I, I note that both uh, Jeff and I are reformed lawyers. And I need to tell those of you in the audience who are still suffering as lawyers that yes, there is a life after lawyering. And indeed, you may find it to be a far better, more rewarding life. And I suspect that Jeff would probably not disagree with that statement. But uh, having digressed, I first now want to thank you all for joining us on this third in a series of webinars sponsored by our very good friends at SCNH Capital. We have been covering the perennially 
most important topics in chapter 11. And today we're going to talk about change of control because in current years, change of control is the outcome in the vast majority of chapter 11 cases. And by change of control, basically we're talking about a sale. And there are two ways to accomplish a sale. Either you do a 363 sale and sell the assets long before confirmation, or you set up the sale in advance and wed it into a chapter 11 plan. And then you effect the sale upon confirmation of the plan. And what we're going to do for the next half hour is to talk about the ins and outs of making those choices and proceeding one way or the other. And that having been said, my first question to this panel is, ideally, when do you begin talking about a plan, sale, or a good old fashioned 363 sale? Well, Bill, that might be the easiest question of the day um, because my answer is, is as soon as possible and as soon as practicable. And, uh, and also that's a conversation that needs to be happening among not just um, the lawyers who haven't seen the light and become uh, reformed lawyers yet, but also uh, Jeff and financial advisors to decide what, what the path is and what the strategy is that you're going to take for the particular case. Are you in a posture where there's a realistic possibility of getting to um, a prepacked plan that might include a debt for equity um, transaction where you can very easily enter bankruptcy and exit quickly? Or um, are you still marketing the assets or still evaluating whether this is a whole co-sale or part of the sale or part of the business sale? And so the earlier that you can get in there and just start building consensus, um, doing everything you can to eliminate your time in chapter 11, which is expensive and disruptive, the better. Yeah, and uh, adding on to Melissa's comments, the uh, you know invariable issue that many of us contend with is friction, um, sometimes with a client about when to actually begin preparing. Clients oftentimes are concerned that beginning to prepare becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. Um, but at the same time, as we try to articulate to clients, th the sooner the preparation takes place, one, the better prepared the company likely is going to be, number one. Number two, the greater the universe of options will be for the company as it relates to a solution set. So said differently, waiting until the very last moment oftentimes results in a scramble and tremendous pressure on, on Melissa and others who are in that uh, lawyer role and all of the other advisors to prepare a company for filing. And sometimes, uh, in some cases, that may be more expensive and more difficult and, and invariably will lead to less optimal outcomes. So the, the, the point of planning sooner oftentimes runs into resistance from clients. And, and it's important and I think incumbent on the advisors to navigate those issues between management and the board um, and other stakeholders around the table to try to get them to engage on that sooner rather than later. Well, you know, that's really interesting, Jeff. You're mentioning that you get resistance from management who perhaps don't recognize the inevitable. Uh, from what quarter does that resistance come? Does it come from boards or does it come from CEOs or does it come from majority shareholders? I mean, where do you encounter that resistance and then how do you do, deal with it when you find it? So sometimes I'll, I'll talk from the role as, as the banker. Oftentimes we'll be engaged to explore a full set of transaction alternatives for a company. And when it becomes apparent to us that the only likely alternatives, if not the only alternatives, are those that will take place inside of a proceeding, having those discussions with management oftentimes are difficult. Um, what management might say externally could be very different than what they're saying internally, meaning internally are they saying to, them, to themselves, what does this mean for my position within the company? Will I still have a job at the back end of this process? What does this look like for me and if I move on to another job and I'm the CEO or CFO of a company that files for Chapter 11? 
Um, and then, of course, there are the negotiations that are taking place between a management and board members and a sponsor as well. Um, and, and that's oftentimes where the, I'll call it sort of the friction or, or, or dynamic plays itself out because everyone, of course, wants to make sure um, that uh, the professionals have exhausted all potential out-of-court options before in-court becomes the path that ends up being selected. Um, and, and oftentimes the discussion will be around just when do you really need to begin that? Now, sometimes the catalyst for that is the lenders. Sometimes the catalyst is liquidity. So sometimes it becomes less about us needing to, um, if you will, um, sort of articulate to management and, uh, and a board exactly uh, why they need to get going on in-court preparation, because it may be in some ways forced on them by external parties. But the most difficult situation is when that pressure from lenders doesn't yet exist and you want to get the preparation started sooner so that the full set of options does exist. Melissa, I don't know if your experience is any different. Right. No, I would, would echo all of that. I can recall um, a recent case where the client was attempting to resolve things out of a court through a sale. And there was you know, some desire to not begin the, the full press prep for a proceeding until it was determined that the out of court sale was, was not a viable option. Um, but knowing that there's, you know, a necessary amount of time to get prepared to um, get aligned on an RSA, that those two objectives really had to happen together, um, proceeding, trying to do this out of court while also uh, preparing in advance for if we were need, uh, needed to file, which in that case we ultimately did. Well, listen, you all mentioned a very important factor, that is liquidity which is another word for financing, either financing now or exit financing later. Uh, to what degree of importance do you attach to investigating liquidity and financing in these pre-filing stages? Yeah, I think it's um, absolutely at the, the top of the list. And I think it's also another area where you have to really lean on your advisors. There's um, oftentimes the forecasting from your advisors is going to look a little different than what the company uh, anticipated or projected that its liquidity would be and getting a realistic and accurate projection of what the future holds is really important. I also think, you know, if it's a case where the end game is a plan and that's going to be supported by a viable new business plan and exit financing is an important component of that. You're going to need to prove that the plan is feasible, um, and you you often can't do that without exit exit financing. Uh, of the many factors the court is going to consider in weighing feasibility at the top of the list will be the adequacy of the debtor's capital structure coming out of bankruptcy. So it's really important to have focus and alignment on what that looks like. Also, with the exit financing, it's important to make sure that the exit financing itself is feasible, that you're not putting a burden on a freshly reorganized company that is going to then lead it right back to the place that it started or in some liquidation. Um, I think it was Judge Sanchi that said in a, in a case where uh, he was actually um, denying confirmation that at the end of the day, these cases are all about liquidity. And I think that's a truth from the time you start preparing for a case to the time that the debtor emerges. Well, listen, tell you what, let's take this as a, as a circumstance early on. Let's assume that there are no debt holders banging on the door to swap debt for equity and become owners. Do you or should you or how can you investigate whether there is an opportunity for a debt swap as an exit strategy? Well, I, you know, I guess I'm going to ask for a few more facts about your 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 scenario, though, Bill. Why why is it in that case that that is what the the company is pursuing as opposed to a sale or trying to um, do something out of court? Well, let's let's take this situation. Yeah. Let's say that maybe you have a buyer. Somebody's already knocking on the door, and you know it's not the best offer you've ever seen. Would you, as a matter of course, uh, talk to management or uh, speak to some of your debt holders about an alternative debt for equity swap as opposed to a sale? Yeah, I think that is an option. I think getting folks under the 10 earlier than later when you're evaluating a significant change of control is important. Um, I also think in a scenario like that, there may be some market testing that you, you need to do. You probably need to 
hire Jeff and have him come in and evaluate whether that, you know, not so great offer is the, what you can do in the market or whether there's other ways to market the assets and figure out uh, if there are, are alternatives on the sale side, in addition to talking to your lenders about a potential debt for equity transaction, whether through an um, out-of-court restructuring, if you're able to get total unanimity or through um, a prepack, if you can get to the threshold number. Um, and then in mm -hmm. that situation, I think we're also curious, what, what's the plan with general unsecured creditors? Are they writing through? Is there significant general unsecured debt? That's all going to weigh into how you go about um, designing that particular plan and approach and strategy. Yeah. Well, listen, what you all have said is that in the very early stages before filing, you're also developing the exit strategy. That's not something just to begin after you have filed an 11 petition. Uh, let's assume for a second that you were not so lucky as to have a client that called you in time and you therefore have what's pretty much a free fall filing where for some reason, perhaps uh, imminent foreclosure or uh, lack of financing, you have to file yourself in chapter 11 real quick. Uh, in those emergency circumstances, uh, how do you approach this question of figuring out <laughs> practically overnight what your exit strategy is going to be in terms of a sale or a plan? Or both, right? Or something that gives you the flexibility to have a toggle depending on how the case plays out. I think in that type of situation, it's really like a do no harm type of mentality going into the case, making sure that you're getting the relief at the outset of the case that is necessary to give you the maximum amount of flexibility depending on which route you might take, um, both operationally and in terms of you know, preserving assets. We uh, think a little bit like assume it's a company where there are really significant NOLs that you want to preserve. In that type of scenario, as, as folks know, the code generally provides that you know, if there's a change in control, the NOLs are going to be significantly limited, but there are some important exceptions available in a bankruptcy that at a very high level, the cap isn't going to apply where shareholders or qualified creditors will end up uh, owning 50% of the stock. So maybe you don't know that that's where the plan is going to go, but that is something that's on the table. And in that case, you're going to do things at the outside of the case to protect that value. You'll file your motion to require certain reporting on trading so that you can come in and try to um, block something if it were to diminish that value. That probably sets up a second webinar on whether um, you can do that. And of course, there's like a recent uh, decision from Judge Walrath on that. But I think of that type of thing as what do I need to do on the first day or the early days of a case to maintain optionality, to preserve value, um, and to try to get to a path where you're either pursuing a debt for equity transaction or a sale or some parallel path where you're marketing the assets at the same time that you're talking to your lenders. Okay, Which now may have let's, thoughts assume, on that too. let's assume we're in 11. And uh, in response to a, a question from someone in our audience, let's uh, mention stalking horses for a minute. How do you go about finding a stalking horse or perhaps more significantly, finding the best stalking horse. So just, ideally you that's somebody, something. You wait for somebody to knock on your door or, or how do you approach the question? No, um, <laughs> one never wants to wait for a stalking horse to knock on the door. And if they're knocking on the door, um, more likely it is a Trojan horse as opposed to a stalking <laughs> horse. Um, so one, one always wants to be well ahead of that. And, um, if the fact pattern is one where we haven't yet filed, obviously that's something that you, the process, you wanna begin that process sufficiently in advance of a filing so that you can do a couple of different things. One, to have contacted a sufficient number of parties in the market so that you're going into the case with a <laughs> compelling third party. That's again, the idea of a stalking horse is to set the floor, not the ceiling. And the idea is to stimulate bidding. So. That stocking horse bid should provide the debtor with as much flexibility as possible when it comes to finding competing bids. And oftentimes there'll be friction there. The stocking horse bidder, as the first one out of the gate, wants to oftentimes restrict things like how long the debtor has to shop the company in chapter 11. 
Sometimes we'll see buyers saying the only kind of qualified bid is a bid that is a bid on all of the assets as an integrated whole. And from our perspective as the debtor, oftentimes we want to and need to have the ability to sell parts of a business because sometimes the sum of the parts could be worth more than the whole. So the idea is to start that process um, as soon as possible out of court so that there's sufficient time to test the market, to identify who prospective parties are, to negotiate a sufficiently uh, flexible agreement that gives the debtor the ability to maximize value inside the Chapter 11 case. And then the question becomes, how long will you have inside of Chapter 11 to actually go run that sale process? And invariably, that's where another point of friction arises. On the one hand, your stocking horse buyer will want you to limit your in-court marketing as much as possible. And from a committee standpoint, oftentimes the committee will want you to have the maximum amount of time to go market those assets. And from the lender standpoint, depending on where that stocking horse bid is relative to the amount of their debt, they may be indifferent if that stocking horse bid, let's say, clears a secured debt. Um, they may be in favor of more time because they might think that the stocking horse bid is artificially low and could generate more value. Or the secured lenders may be of the view that the amount of incremental value that could be realized through a sale process will not be offset by the incremental expenses that the estate will incur inside of Chapter 11. And so the secured lenders who are likely funding the case may want a more compressed time frame. So those are some of the dynamics, all the more reason why it's imperative to have a stocking horse before you file. And then most importantly, for Melissa and, and, and other lead counsel who's going to be making that presentation on the first day of the case, to be able to go into the court, to be able to say, Your Honor, while it's, you know, while it's um, disappointing that the company has needed to file for Chapter 11, we're here to deliver good news that we have a buyer that will maintain the going concern value of the enterprise, that will maintain jobs, and, and will continue to do business with its customers and its suppliers. And that ends up being an important message delivered to employees and other stakeholders so that you can stabilize the company on the first day of the case, as opposed to going in in that free fall scenario that creates a tremendous amount of uncertainty for all stakeholders, employees included, who you know begin to get quite concerned about what the prospect is of, of job, uh, you know, job security. Well, you know, this is very interesting. We have spent more than half of our time talking about events before filing, but I think what comes across very clearly is uh, certainly in all events, if you possibly can, you need to get the disposition of the company, uh, at least in the form of something like a stalking horse before you file. So that's a chief takeaway. I also noticed that Jeff again mentioned the word friction, <laughs> which I guess uh, is uh, throughout the chapter 11 process. And I got to tell you, avoiding that friction is one of the reasons I would never think about going into the practice of law again. But let's let's move on. To the next question, you've got a, a buyer. Somebody wants to own the company. How do you and the buyer determine what's best for the buyer or the company in a sale or effecting the sale through a Chapter 11 reorganization plan? How do you do it? Melissa, do you want to address the whether it was a 363 versus a plan? Yeah, I mean, I, I can start with that. And Jeff, I'm curious for your perspective too. But I mean, I think all of this depends on the circumstances, right? So needing to understand, you have a buyer, have you identified that buyer before the filing? Is this something where, I mean, it, as a general rule, we're trying to limit our time in chapter 11, right? We're trying to limit uncertainty. So are you able to wrap this up in a debt for equity transaction where you're coming in on the first day or shortly thereafter with a plan and disclosure statement that's supported um, by a sufficient number, or have you pre-solicited if you're not affecting journal and secured creditors, then you know that path may be the fastest route to get there. If you're not there, then a sale generally is going to be something that you can affect with the stocking horse bidder in your pocket faster than beginning the plan process and solicitation in the bankruptcy if you're not in a pre-negotiated or pre-packed area. They're also, from your buyer's perspective, are going to be important considerations. Is there successor liability? Are there assets that are being you know, separated off? Are there liabilities that, that, that are trying to be left behind versus 
continuing as a going concern. And then I think Jeff pointed out the importance of looking at your customer base and your employee base. Um, what what are customer expectations here? What is the best way to prevent uh, value from leaving the enterprise while you're either reorganizing around a plan that effectuates this change of control or a sale? And that may depend on the industry. Are you in the service industry? Are customers portable? All of those things that are uh, factors that we'll consider. And it may, in different cases, weigh in favor of a different approach, whether that's a sale or affecting the uh, change of control through a plan. Let me ask you a tough question. Let's assume you've got a buyer who is willing to buy the thing in a 363 sale uh, as soon as possible. Would there be any circumstances under which you would guide the debtor and the buyer to do a chapter 11 reorganization instead of a, of a sale? I think speed is is paramount here, Bill. And if you've got a buyer that's in and it's a good buyer and you think that, um, you know, you're also at that point weighing in a plan, we've got to get creditor votes. We have to satisfy 1129. In a sale, you're looking at business judgment and yeah, creditors can object, but ultimately you don't need to build the type of consensus. So uh, generally, I think my answer would be the sale is the preferred option, both for that buyer and likely for the debtor too. Well, I suppose also if you have a sale, you don't have major valuation problems, which can be really hairy in trying to confirm a Chapter 11 plan. Uh, well, that's uh, uh, also, by the way, generally speaking, if you have a sale and you have completed a sale, uh, do you view the plan confirmation process as, as easier because you have effected a sale already? It may be. You may not even get to plan confirmation if you've affected a sale, right? It depends whether you want to try to pursue some sort of liquidation plan or are you doing um, some sort of structured type dismissal. So you may not even need to get to that point. Um, but I think generally the more uncertainties and more value you can create during the case, the better. So, yes. And obviously, from you know, from the company's standpoint, the, the the preference always is to try to complete a Chapter Eleven case with a plan, but that's obviously going to be de determined by things like liquidity and an agreement with if you've got secured lenders who are undersecured, is there um, cash that they're prepared to leave behind to permit a plan to try to get confirmed? Um, what will the plan of confirmation uh, resolve? Sometimes at a three sixty three sale, we may see. Um, an agreement reached where Chapter 5 causes of action may be purchased by a buyer. That tends to be a very contentious issue. And sometimes there'll be an exchange if there's a purchase of Chapter 5 causes of action. Will there be money that's left behind for creditors um, you know, in, in exchange for satisfying that? Um, invariably, from a company standpoint, you also have the issue of releases. Right. Um, and right, you, you know, from from the directors and officers perspective, they want to know that if they're going to go through this process of taking the company through a sale, um, that there'll be releases for them. And so those tend to be the things oftentimes in most cases, not all cases, but that will drive and determine and dictate, you know, the ability to to go consummate a plan. Well, the releases are very uh, 2023 topics. So uh, yeah. hopefully those will continue to drive the process, but time right. will tell us first. Back, uh, back in the springtime when we were first planning this episode, uh, I was really intending to focus a great deal on releases. But then lo and behold, <laughs> the support in August decided that they were going to grant certiorari in the Purdue Pharma case. And I have sort of pulled back my horns talking much about releases, because I suspect that when we get a decision from the Supreme Court in Purdue, probably sometime around February or March of next year, well, that's going to tell us a lot about what we can and can't do in terms of releases. And by the way, of course, ABI is going to be uh, covering Purdue, and we already have like a bucket of paint, because that's the biggest thing to have come to the Supreme Court in a while. And by the way, just as a sleeper, there is another case where the Supreme Court granted certiorari about a month ago. That's a it may not have hit your radar screen, but the question is about standing in bankruptcy cases. And here is one where the Supreme Court very well 
may overturn the apple cart on what we have thought about standing. But again, stand by and we at ABI will be covering that and discussing it extensively at our programs once we have decisions from the Supreme Court. Well, folks, I'm sad to say, I think our time is about over here. Um, I have learned a good deal from you. And I have also uh, confirmed uh, that I made a good judgment a number of years ago when I started or when I uh, stopped practicing law. And, and Melissa, God willing, one of these days, you too will see the light. And well, I will try to end on a positive note, Bill, that <laughs> uh, I think for many of us practicing lawyers, guiding the company through these these changes, working with, with people like Jeff and with people like Kevin, though, um, it, it really is some of the, the most fun and interesting work that we do. And I think if there's one takeaway from this program, it's that it really depends on facts, circumstances, objectives, timings, and what the Supreme Court does in Purdue. So thank you for having us. Yeah, well, thank, thank you, you Bill, Melissa. and thank, thank you, you, Melissa, and thank you to the ABI for hosting this panel. Okay, you all be well. We'll uh, join you again sometime and have your eye on the ABI website to learn about our next offerings. So until then, good day, and we'll see you again soon. Thank you. Thank you.